First speaker, Dr. Duncan Roger Chapman, is co-director of Wake Radiology Breast MRI Program. Uh, his special clinical interests are breast MRI, which is good since you're co-director, and uh, body imaging. Dr. Uh, Roger Chapman joined Wake Radiology in 2004. Uh, he's a native of Brussels, Belgium, which I did not know until I put this thing together. I it's keep a lot of things from you. <laughs> He graduated from medical school at Duke, where he also completed his radiology uh, residency. He then completed a fellowship in body imaging at Stanford University in California. He's a member of uh, several radiology societies, and uh, he's a stud. He's an Ironman competitor, exercises more in one day before 7 o'clock in the morning than I do all week. Um, and he'll be speaking to us on breast imaging updates. Please welcome. Dr. Roger Chapman. Thank you. So is this, uh, is this working? You're all right? All right. Um, Bill did a good job. My name said his name gets butchered. Uh, you can imagine Roger Chapman as I grew up. It was, uh, it was a struggle every time I, I got into a class and the teacher tried to say my name the first day. And uh, now my neighbors and the kids all call me uh, Dr. R.C. So, if you don't want to say Roger Chapman and uh, you're struggling with my name and you have a question, say you know, Dr. R.C. or Mr. R.C., you know, uh, please answer my question. Uh, so today uh, we're going to start things off with breast imaging. It's a hot topic right now. It's uh, got a lot of uh, uh, play in the, in the lay press lately. We're coming off the month that was uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So. Uh, Oprah has been having her shows, and, and uh, the News and Observer has had multiple articles uh, discussing uh, breast imaging in particular, uh, mammography, and the roles of mammography, the role of MRI in, uh, in breast imaging. So uh, we'll kind of get off here the bang, and hopefully we'll, we'll get through in a reasonable amount of time because there is a football game today. I don't know if anyone's interested in that, but I am. Uh, Duke and Carolina. It's finally a game that, that means something this year, so I'm excited to uh, maybe see part of it. So you have a, uh, an outline in front of you that that's the point of this one. Forward. Let's see if it does it again. All right. Okay. So you have a basic outline in front of you. Uh, it's going to cover the, the modalities that we as radiologists use in breast imaging on a daily basis. There are some things that are not covered. Um, we do cover, we're going to cover screening mammography, diagnostic mammography, screening uh, or diagnostic uh, ultrasound and ultrasound for intervention, uh, MRI, a little bit on molecular imaging, and just touch on thermography. There are other uh, imaging modalities that are used in breast imaging, and, and they're becoming more popular, and, and studies are coming out uh, almost weekly on their uses, and that's CT and PET, but, but we're going to stick to what's used today on a regular basis. Which imaging study to use? So we, we'll go with uh, Einstein's paradigm. Everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. Normal selection process in imaging, uh, for radiologists, we expect that uh, our clinicians have an inherent knowledge of, of modalities to choose which imaging uh, study to uh, use on their patients. Um, whether that's, you know, if you have a lung nodule, we know that uh, CT is very good in, in, in the thorax. Uh, MRI is not good in the thorax. For uh, female pelvis, CT is not very good in the pelvis, and MRI is, is very good in the pelvis. Um, so we kind of expect that the, our referring clinicians have a, a general fund of knowledge. That they're going to order appropriate tests, and if they have a question, they can call us, or in certain cases, the insurance company will call them back when they order. Uh, so you order the appropriate exam, and you get meaningful results by ordering the appropriate exam. Part of the reason we, we brought this conference together is that we see so much in our community uh, exams are ordered that really are not the appropriate exam. And, uh, and so patients are put through test after test when a single test could, could likely answer the questions. 
breast imaging in particular uh, is not um, not as painful in, in, the, in, uh, in the ordering process and that uh, there isn't that expectation. You have this enormous fund of knowledge of, of what uh, study is best. Um, the American College of Radiology in 1993 put together uh, the BIRAD system with the American College of Surgeons, uh, the uh, ACR, uh, the uh, National Cancer Institute, and the American Cancer Society. And this is a, a reporting system, uh, an algorithm uh, that, uh, that forces radiologists to read, in particular, screening mammography in, in a consistent manner across the United States. Well, as consistent as you can get some radiologists you know, here and there. Um, so in this system, lesions are ranked uh, from one to six. Consistency between radiologists is the goal, and it, and it reduces guesswork on the part of the referring docs. So this was, this was built for you more than it was built for us. So the, the lesions or mammograms are read uh, from one to six. So if you get a, have a screening mammogram that's performed, uh, a BIREDS-1 is a normal exam, and for you, the follow-up, yearly mammogram. A BIREDS-2 is a, a benign finding, such as calcifications that are stable, uh, a cyst um, that's stable, uh, and that's a, a one-year follow-up as well. And then three, four, five, and six are probably benign, suspicious, um, thought malignant, and, uh, and a known malignancy for which you can see an established follow-up is set for you. Um, on a screening mammogram, you have to remember, the only, the only result you can get on a screening mammogram is normal, benign, or, which isn't listed here, by right zero means the patient has to come back. So it's a simple system. Einstein didn't actually say this. So in, in the basic uh, clinical process, the patient comes to you, has a sign, pain, or a screening abnormality. Test is done. Detection is made. Then another test. This is great for radiologists because these tests are usually radiological. Uh, diagnosis is given. Next is staging. And then from staging, you get appropriate therapy and treatment. I know this sounds somewhat simple, but let's define what, uh, what these are. What is a screening test? A screening test is designed to find disease early before a patient manifests symptoms. So it's, it's a test used in a large population to find disease that's rare. Components, simple to perform. This is the ideal screening test. Large capacity to, to test many. It's available everywhere. Inexpensive, must do no harm, it's very important. And so our goal is specificity, or sensitivity, early detection. We want to find disease before it manifests itself. And uh, such as in uh, screening, alt or screening mammograms, finding early disease before it's, uh, it's relevant. What is a diagnostic test? Test is designed to characterize a known abnormality. So you have to have either a symptom, nausea, pain, a sign such as a mass, or a lesion, something you've seen on a screening examination. Cost, availability, pain, and simplicity, not considerations. Well, they are considerations when insurance companies and government are involved, but they're not the primary consideration. That is, specificity, what are we seeing? And what is a staging test? test to determine the amount of disease. Two types of staging tests. There's local regional, which is for the breast. You would think the lymphatics and the axilla. And then all, also non-regional, distant metastatic disease. How much disease is present? So in breast cancer, why do we need to know that? Well, you know, if it's localized disease, uh, the patient would likely be uh, amenable to conservative therapy. So. Uh, lumpectomy and radiation. If there's distant disease, well, an oncologist has to get involved. So let's start with mammography. So screening mammography. Indications, all women between the ages of 40 and 80, you can start at the age of uh, 35. Strong family history, uh, 
start at 30. Right now, breast MRI is playing a role in that, so that's changing. Before mammoplasty, so before uh, breast augmentation or reduction, the last thing you want to do is remove a bunch of breast tissue and find that there was cancer in the tissue. It still does happen. I was at a conference yesterday where they were discussing uh, that exact case where cancer was found despite mammography performed uh, beforehand. So in screening mammography, it's a binary readout, meaning it's, it's either positive or negative, meaning you're going to get a BIRADS 1, 2, or coming back, uh, BIRADS 0. So there's no, if you get a screening mammogram right back from, from a radiologist that a patient's uh, been sent to, and it says BIRADS 3, this is a, something that needs follow-up, uh, likely benign, and they haven't had a diagnostic study, it's inappropriate. You should not get anything other than a BIRADS 1, 2, or 0 off a screening exam. So mammography, it's an ideal screening test, 40, 69 year olds. It's, uh, it's the only uh, screening test in uh, breast imaging that has shown mortality benefit. You know, we do, we're doing MRI, we're doing molecular imaging, we do screening ultrasound and so on. The screening mammograms, only modality that shows mortality benefit. Has high resolution, it's good for early detection. Why is that important? Uh, calcifications. So this is ductal cancer. So, so cancer within the breast tends to, to develop in a very systematic pattern. So it starts with uh, atypical ductal hyperplasia. Uh, the duct fills with abnormal cells. It's contained within a basement membrane. Subsequently, uh, DCIS, which is uh, several ducts uh, are, are filled with abnormal cells, often presents with calcifications that you can see in a mammogram. And what you don't want to get is IDC, invasive ductal carcinoma, cats out of the bag, disease can spread. We want to catch the disease at the ADH or the DCIS level. It doesn't show calcifications here for ADH, but ADH does often present with calcifications. Weaknesses of mammography. Uses radiation, ionizing radiation. In the order of 10 chest radiographs. Uses compression. For some women, this is, this is a very painful experience. And then in the setting of dense breasts, mammography can have limitations. So this is a, a, an MLO view, or basically a sagittal image of a breast in a, in a fattier place breast. So for, for a mammography, this is great. You know, we see this, and think, gosh, I can see anything in there. You know, there's some fibroglandular tissues, but if there's a mass in here, I'm going to see it. If there are calcifications in here, I'm going to see them. Uh, but... Uh, as the tissue of the, uh, the breast gets denser, so scattered fibroglandular elements, a little, little bit harder, heterogeneously dense, well, some things can hide in there. And then extremely dense, that's tough to see just about anything in there. You hide a lot of stuff. Um, so as, as the density of the breast, uh, or the, the breast gets more dense, uh, mammography gets less sensitive. Uh, you'll see at the start of every report, or you should, the first line in every mammogram should, should tell you what the density of the breast is. There are only four densities. It's a lexicon that's established by BIRADS. This is uh, fatty replaced, scattered fibroglandular elements, heterogeneously dense, and extremely dense. That's going to tell you right away how good is this mammogram for screening this woman. If it says extremely dense, even though we're not saying it elsewhere in the report, we're letting you know that this is going to be this is a tough mammogram. A lot of things can hide in there. So here's an example of fattier placed, then extremely dense side by side. You can see the sens sensitivity for uh, detecting cancer is going to be quite different between the two. This is about a one centimeter cancer. You can stick in a fattier placed breast, and you can walk in the room and you can see it. You don't really need to be a mammography to see that. Put that in heterogeneously dense breasts, still see it. Extremely dense breasts, you better hope you have a good physical exam because I'm not going to see that. False negative rate, 
This is from screen film mammography. It's 20%. In the best of hands, that number was uh, 15%. Now digital techniques are, are coming into play, and we really don't know how much better the number is going to get. I think it's going to get a little bit better. It's not going to be dramatic. False positive rate, 6%. So what happens if you get a BIRAD zero? Now this is something that, you know, we send, by law, we send a letter to the patient saying they need to come back. Um, and, and this is when we can't call it negative, we can't call it uh, um, benign finding. And there's something on, the, on the, the mammogram that just raises the question. This is not an abnormal thing. Um, it, in our practice, uh, of all screening mammograms, a little over 6% are called back for diagnostic studies. Now, very, very few of those women have cancer. But we got to get 6% back to look at things that we need to see better, whether it's compression views or subsequent ultrasound, we have to make sure that, uh, that something's okay. Um, it's important on your part as a clinician, given the, uh, the anxiety that the, these letters can promote, promote in, in women, especially if it's the first time being called back, is to alleviate their fears that, you know, this is not an abnormal thing. In this practice, 6% get called back. In the United States, that number ranges between 10 to 15%. Uh, in Europe, uh, they try to get a callback rate in the range of three to four percent. So we're not we're, we're not as good as they are, but uh, um, but it does not necessarily mean that, that you have a cancer if you're called back from uh, screen, uh, screening mammogram. So diagnostic mammography. Next step. So come back for more compression views. And the, the BIRADS category is just, uh, it's uh, a new BIRADS is, is given. So you come, to, come back with a zero. And, and from a diagnostic exam, I can give any, any one of the BIRADS categories from one could be negative uh, all the way to, well, I can't give you a six because that, that requires a biopsy, but uh, all the way to uh, thought, thought malignant. So it determines your next step. What to remember with mammography? Annual screening mammography is mandatory. All the societies worldwide state this. Meta-analyses show that the mortality benefit, no one thinks otherwise. Recall for a diagnostic mammogram does not mean bad news. Please explain that to your patients when they call you. So what's the next step? Diagnostic ultrasound. Strengths, it's well tolerated. There's no compression. It's widely available relatively inexpensive, and there's no ionizing radiation. So its uses uh, are multiple. You use it in conjunction with mammography, obviously, but uh, first, if you can't see something on a, on a mammogram, the patient has a palpable abnormality, ultrasound is a very good exam. You could palpate the abnormality, put the uh, uh, put your probe right on the abnormality and see if something's there. Is it just breast tissue or is there a mass? Two, it's very good with cysts versus solid. So this is a, a cyst, anechoic lesion, good through transmission, just a benign finding. See it often uh, within, within breasts, and it's often presents as a palpable abnormality. I think if we took uh, every woman in the room and, and did uh, ultrasound of your breasts, 90% of you would probably have a cyst in your breast. Solid lesions, a little tougher to evaluate with ultrasound. And it also guides intervention. So if you could see an abnormality on your ultrasound, then you could biopsy with ultrasound. And, it's the, and they're the best biopsies to do because it's a, it's a comfortable position for a female to be in for a biopsy, lying supine. And then since we have real-time imaging, we can see the biopsy taking place. You can see your needle in the lesion, and you can see the tissue being taken. When you're, you're performing biopsies with uh, using mammography or with MRI, uh, you put your needle in a position where you think it's right, and then the tissue is taken, but you can't see the tissue being taken. You have to send that tissue back to the pathologist, and they tell you whether or not you, you, you've got what you need. Um, so can, can I have sampling errors because of that? Weaknesses, it's not regulated. And it's very operator dependent. Uh, we, as radiologists, tend to work with, with technologists, sonographers, who are professionally trained. 
Um, majority of them are very, very good. But even in the spectrum of sonographers, there are some sonographers who are, are excellent, and there are some sonographers where you really feel like you have to go back and check everything that's done. And, and, that, and that's among the professionally trained sonographers. Now, uh, mammography is regulated by the government. You know, we can't stray too far from, from what is right in, in, in uh, mammography because we have to meet certain guidelines and strict criteria. But sonography, there's, there's no regulation. Anyone can have an ultrasound machine. Um, right now, Siemens GE are trying to get every med student that starts the first year of med school to buy an ultrasound machine so they can start using it. So you can see there's, there's going to be a wide, wide spectrum of skill sets using ultrasound. And then there's a correlation between mammograms and ultrasound uh, for biopsies. So on a mammogram, the female audience is going to know this, so you're sitting upright for your, for your views and you're in compression. So you're going to have craniocaudal compression, sagittal compression for MLO views. On an ultrasound, so you see something, say it's upper breasts, then you go to an ultrasound and all of a sudden you, you throw your arm behind your head and you, you're lying on your back. You know, where that lesion is is not so simple to see you know, on an ultrasound what you're seeing on a mammogram, to correlate the two. We can generally do it, but, but it's not a simple thing. And that can also lead to sampling errors. And then the specificity for ultrasound in the setting of solid lesions. Certain solid lesions, in particular fiber adenomas, there are some, some uh, criteria, which based on a, a paper by Stavros, that we can utilize that will give us a 96 to 98% chance it's a, it's a benign lesion. But outside of, of those fiber adenomas, for solid lesions within the breast and ultrasound, it's not a very uh, specific exam. It's kind of toss a coin. So indications, it's primarily used in conjunction with mammography. So if you're ordering, order the mammogram, diagnostic mammogram with ultrasound if required. It's good cis versus solid, has uh, limited solid lesion specificity. And it's great, has a real-time guidance tool for biopsies. So final thing, it's not a screening tool. Uh, we get a request on a weekly basis for screening uh, diagnostic or screening uh, ultrasound in uh, a patient who doesn't like the compression on mammograms or for, for some reason or other has been on the internet and, and feels like uh, that, that ultrasound would be a better choice than a mammogram. Um, a lot of this came out of this Akron trial 6666, which is an ongoing trial right now, and, but they released the preliminary results on the trial and stated that in conjunction with mammography, screening ultrasound caught more cancers. So this was all over the place. You know, kind of Wall Street Journal, New York Times, they're saying ultrasound is this great thing. But the lay press actually took, that, took it out and said, screening ultrasound found these cancers. It didn't say in conjunction with mammography. It just said screening ultrasound found them, um, which was not true. It was the two together. So the... Uh, authors of the trial and, and, and other reviewers of the, of the study have, have come out and said that no, uh, screening ultrasound is not uh, something that should be done outside of clinical trials right now. And, and, and the reason for that is you really go back to the, there, there's no, uh, no regulation of ultrasound, meaning you, know, you can do screening ultrasound in, a, in, a, in the hands of a very, very good mammographer who has good ultrasound skills. It's a great test. It really is. You know, we've, we've got several you know, members of our practice that are very good at this if they've give, been given the time, uh, and they're the right ones, you know, it comes to them. Unfortunately, you know, we only have a couple in our practice out of 60 docs that really could do this. Um, and then, you know, if, if you take the whole spectrum of physicians and, and order these te this particular test, you really, you know, there's a very good chance you're not going to hit the guy or, or, or a woman that really knows how to do a screening ultrasound. So um, it's generally not recommended. So diag uh, diagnostic ultrasound. Breast ultrasound is a diagnostic test, not a screening test. Um, I threw this in before MRI because uh, it's something that that you probably should know before the MRI. I, I, how do you estimate risk for breast cancer in women? Um, 
So there are multiple models that are currently utilized to estimate a woman's lifetime risk for breast cancer. Uh, the most commonly used is a GAIL model, G-A-I-L, GAIL model. It's what's used uh, locally with our surgeons, our geneticists. I'm pretty sure they're using GAIL over at Duke as well, and, and you, I know UNC uses it. So um, it's very simple. If you go to the NCI website, or if you just want to Google uh, GAIL, it's the first site that comes up, the NCI website, has the calculator. If you have a woman that, that appears to have uh, uh, a high risk for breast cancer, you could calculate this risk in all of 30 seconds. So it's eight simple questions. Personal history of breast cancer, DCIS, LCIS, patient's age, uh, age at first uh, menstrual cycle, age of first live birth, um, any family history of breast cancer, how many first degree relatives, any biopsy, number of positives, negatives, and ethnicity. That's it. Eight questions and it will pump out a number. Uh, if that number is greater than 20%, then per the American Cancer Society guidelines, the woman is a candidate for screening MRI. Um, so uh, the insurance companies as well if you're going to order an MRI to screen a, screen a woman, generally this is the best thing to do beforehand so that you don't have someone you know, getting a, a bill sent back to them because the insurance companies won't pay for it. They want to see a 20% or greater risk in their screening populations. So MRI, strengths, no radiation. It's extremely sensitive for cancer, 97%. That's uh, multiple studies have shown that. Very high negative predictive value. It's great for high-risk screening. It's the most accurate staging method to date for breast cancer. There's no compression, although very, very mild compression. Let me go over here. Let's see if this thing still works. And you can guide biopsy with MRI. So weaknesses. It requires expertise. The early results uh, for studies with MRI uh, were very, very low uh, in specificity. Still a great sensitivity, very low specificity. Part of that was the, the equipment that was being used was uh, in general substandard, not what it is today. Uh, and then the expertise was limited at that time. I mean, the physicians who were reading the studies didn't really know what they were supposed to be looking for other than enhancement within the breast enhancing patterns that have subsequently been studied and, and uh, you know, put in the literature to help guide us to what is normal and what is abnormal. They, they really didn't know that. So the specificities were very low. Uh, an example within our practice, we have three current readers of breast MRI. Uh, in the first 500 uh, studies done in the practice, the lesions were BIREDS 4 and 5, so lesions we recommended biopsies on, we had a 25% uh, positive predictive value. It doesn't, doesn't sound bad, but 25%. So three out of four lesions were benign. The second 500, we were at 40%. And the 1,000 after that, we jumped to 55%. So you can see, with experience, you're going to get a lot better saying what is negative, what is positive. Um, those numbers are tough to come by just because the volumes of, of breast MRI are, are, are not particularly high. Um, you're going to have certain individuals that, that, that train at, at uh, high, volume, high volume institutions, and I think Duke probably has a pretty, pretty good volume now. They're going to have much more uh, expertise coming out of training, but um, you'd be surprised how many people are reading breast MRI as um, just general MRI readers, and they'll read one a week. Not going to be very good at it, reading one a week. It's expensive. You can get claustrophobic in the magnet, which we usually have an answer for. And then positioning. So this is how a woman is positioned in the magnet for a breast MRI. They're prone, um, head down, going into the magnet head first. So if you're going to be claustrophobic on your back, you're definitely going to be claustrophobic in a line like this. It's, uh, I'd like to say it's, it's, it's a pleasant experience for women to do this. It's not. No one enjoys this. So it's, it's, it's a tough thing to go through. Then if you have metal implants, you're not a candidate for MRI. 
indications for breast MRI per the American Cancer Society guidelines. This came out about a year ago. One, it's uh, for screening, it's that 20% number. Gale model calculator. Very simple. You know, I have it, you know, when I, my, I log on to my computer, it's just on one of my favorites, you know, Gale model calculator. I can, someone asks me the questions, I can calculate it in a matter of seconds. BRCA1 and 2 and first degree relatives that are untested. Dense mammograms with atypia on a biopsy. That's uh, primarily to see if they, they, that uh, there was a sampling error, meaning there's, you found atypia on your biopsy, but was there cancer sitting right next to it? Scar versus recurrence, uh, status post lumpectomy, save a patient a biopsy, and then scre uh, screening the contralateral breast in a known breast malignancy. History of chest XRT, so patients that had lymphoma when they're in their uh, teens. And then rare syndromes such as Lee Fraumini and several others where the genetic variants. So this is uh, bilateral CC views in a mammogram, patient with uh, heterogeneously dense breasts to dense breasts. Tough to see anything. If we get the lights down. So, you might even need more lights down. That's all right, we'll work on it. So, all right, so this is an a, a image from an MRI, uh, right breast, left breast. We're looking feet up. And so the same breast that you saw, the, the heterogeneously dense breast to extremely dense breast, you've got about a three centimeter cancer in one and two centimeter cancer in another. These are our examples of cases we've seen. These bright lights are kind of hard on me anyways. I usually work in a dark hole. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So here's a, a woman with uh, uh, extremely dense breasts on screening mammography, has lots of calcifications within the right breast. Don't look so bad. Tough to really see anything, the breasts are so dense. But she's got a palpable abnormality on the right, and she presents. Ultrasound just looked odd, but couldn't really see anything focal on this patient. These, this is this craniocaudal views, same thing. So we take the right breast, that's the CC view, and that's the MRI. So on the MRI, see is diffuse enhancement within the breast. So a big draining vein. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, well, you need to see other breasts to see what it means. Some, some women's breasts, if they're a certain uh, uh, part of their cycle and they're premenopausal, uh, we call them uh, light bulb breasts. I mean, they just, they just light up. Everything lights up. It's hormonal stimulation. But that's why you do a bilateral exam. The other breasts, stippled enhancement, which is normal. This patient had cancer that incorporated the breast in its entirety. So mammography is, mammography is good. MRI is a lot better. National standards of bilateral exam. I trained uh, uh, in an institution where we did unilateral exams. And, I, and my professors would always say, you don't need the bilateral exam. You just, all you need is the one breast. And I thought, oh, yeah, these guys are right. These guys are right. But they were wrong. They were definitely wrong. Scar versus recurrence. So this is uh, MLO and CC views. Uh, uh, a breast that in a patient who has had a prior lumpectomy and on mammogram it looked like the scar was changing over the course of time. Normally this would just require a biopsy. Surgeon go back in. With MR you can look at the breast, see the scar and this is a color mapping so if there's enhancement in, in the region of the scar, it's going to show on my color map. There's, there's no enhancement, meaning there's no blood supply going to that region. And here's the bilateral exam in the patient. It's a negative exam. There's no evidence of cancer recurrence. They don't need a biopsy.
staging breast MRI. This is still probably the number one uh, uh, source of referrals for breast MRI to date in our practice is the staging of known cancer. This is one of many articles uh, on staging two years ago stating that uh, breast MRI is very useful. It's the best uh, modality to stage the breast. In their study, 10% uh, of uh, women had a contralateral malignancy at the time of staging or an ipsilateral malignancy that was multicentric, meaning remote to the primary mass. Subsequent studies have ranged between 8 and 16% uh, in, in finding uh, multicentric versus contralateral disease. In our practice, uh, we're at 4% contralateral disease in our staging uh, exams. Um, we, we haven't been tracking the ipsilateral multicentricity. It's a very tough thing to track. So MRI is far and away the most accurate staging modality to date, although PET is now getting some, some play, but probably several years before that really comes out good, with good data. So imaging quality varies nationwide with MRI. Spire beware. Know where you're sending your patients. It's, you've, you've got a good situation here in that you've got Duke down the, down the road. And they do a great job. You've got, you've got uh, UNC also does a very good job with MRI, and you've got, we think we do a very good job. So um, that's not the case if you go you know, further out uh, within the community, and uh, you, know, you just really have to be careful where, where they're going. So this is Eda Pisano, uh, and their uh, most recent study, they showed that of the cancers they found in the contralateral breast in their staging exams, 60% were invasive cancers. They potentially would have killed the patient. So now they stage every one of their patients that has a known malignancy uh, with uh, MRI to screen the contralateral breast. So classic indications in certain patients, MRI would be beneficial. Current indications says all women. Well, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think that if a woman is completely fatty replaced, you could see everything in the other breast with, with mammogram fine. I don't really think they need an MRI. Um, but those, you know, there aren't that many that come through that are completely fatty replaced. So in, in, uh, in women with scattered fibroglandular elements or, or dense breasts, MRI, I think, uh, should be performed. Is it really valuable in, this, in the staging setting? Well, this is just one of many uh, studies that shows that uh, management of uh, uh, the disease has changed not just in the, the 8 to 16 percent of women who have multicentric versus contralateral disease, but surgical management can be changed with chest wall invasion that's unknown, or lymphadenopathy that's unknown, metastatic disease that's uh, remote uh, to the cancer within the bones and so on, it's unknown. Uh, so, a lot of benefits. So, this is what our, our computers can do, and they couldn't do five, six years ago. So, take the skin away, you can see the cancer inside the breast. Take the cancer out, show it to the surgeons, see how it sits within the breast. So again, you take the skin away. If you want to take the vasculature away, take that away. Isolate the cancer. Give a volume. Well, why is this relevant? Well, nowadays, one of the other indications for MRI is pre and post uh, chemotherapy, in particular neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and see if, if the chemotherapy is working. Uh, if, if it's not working on the MRI, uh, generally it's, it's, it's not effective and they need to switch their chemotherapeutic agents. Accurate staging. So this is a water sensitive sequence where you can see in the, uh, the medial right breast uh, fluid collection, which is their post lumpectomy site. Conventional imaging didn't show anything else within the breast and the patient was going to go on to local radiation therapy. Got an MRI, what they didn't know was something else within that breast. So that on color map, 
It enhances. This is the curve of enhancement, meaning it, it takes blood in quickly and it lets it go fast. That's a type 3 curve, what we, what we call a cancer curve. This is what our malignancies generally do. So in a reformatted sagittal image, you can see the lumpectomy site. Looks pretty clean. A little bit of enhancement at the edges, which is normal in the post-lumpectomy setting. Four centimeters away, there's another cancer. This was DCIS. This is a precancer. This was a very aggressive invasive cancer. Never would have been known. Would have been outside the field of radiation. So there's no better staging method currently. You need dedicated rendering computers. You need the right equipment. So this is an example of fibrocystic disease. We see this all the time, but not to this extent. This is a pretty dramatic case of fibrocystic disease. So this is a patient that, you know, on the mammogram, well, I don't know, is that all normal? Uh, or cysts? Uh, on ultrasound, a lot of these cysts have com complex features. So this is one of those patients where we just couldn't figure anything out based on conventional imaging. So on MRI, this is a water sensitive sequence. And you can see some of these cysts are different, a little bit different color than the others. Some are very simple, some are more complex, some have who knows what within them. But when we give contrast and subtract out the cysts, there's nothing there. Nothing enhances. There's no evidence of malignancy. It's a negative exam. So what to remember, Ex expense, availability, and expertise uh, restrict usage. Um, availability, you know, you know, there are lots of magnets all over. But it, it, if you start using breast MRI to screen the standard patient population, there's no way we'd be able to get the women through. They would take up all our magnets. You, know, they, you wouldn't be able to do a knee or a brain or anything else. It would just take, take them all. So it, it, it is restricted to women who meet certain criteria. Use the Gale model to decide who those women are. And then molecular imaging. So this is something new. Um, BSGI, uh, breast specific gamma imaging, also called Miraluma, uh, is where a radio tracer is, is injected in the arm. It's allowed to accumulate within the breast and then uh, mammographic views of the breasts are obtained. Uh, look like mammograms, both CC and, and MLO views. Uh, Strengths, it's very has a very high sensitivity for cancer. Very high negative predictive value on the order of 99%. Inexpensive, it's a relative. Much less expensive than MRI. Very light compression. Weaknesses, it uses radiation on the order of what you'd get from a CT scan. has limited availability. I, I, we, I believe we're the only practitioners in Raleigh that, that have uh, BSGI. I don't know if, if Duke is using it now. Duke still doesn't have it. I don't think UNC has it. Uh, so there isn't a lot of availability. Comp there is some compression involved. Indications are similar to MRI, but generally in a lower risk population. So we use this for problem solving. Palpable mass, negative mammogram and ultrasound, uh, patient with dense breasts or uh, prominent fibrocystic disease, but they don't meet the guidelines for the American Cancer Society for breast MRI. Um, it's, uh, it's great if you get a negative exam. Because of its high negative predictive value. If you, got an, if you get a negative exam on a, on a Miraluma, it's going to be negative. Problem is when it's positive. Let's go back here. Um, with a positive Miraluma, uh, there's no means of accessing the abnormality with the Miraluma scan. Meaning, you know, if I see an, an abnormality in an ultrasound, well, I can stick a needle in it while I look at it under ultrasound. If I see an abnormality um, on MRI, I can target the lesion with MRI and, and go get it, get a piece. Well, with, with Miraluma, you get a positive study. Basically, the patient has to go and get another study. Generally, that's going to be an MRI, and that gets expensive when you go and study to study to study. Thermography, uh, just briefly, um, it gets uh, some positive press on the internet. Uh, doesn't merit it. 
um, based on uh, what the government has to say about it, uh, it's ineffective and doesn't and finds uh, no more than half of uh, malignancies. And if you think about mammograms, mammograms you're getting 85 percent, you know, in good hands. Thermography, 50 percent. Uh, that's there's not a lot of benefit to that. And this, these are just these are quotes from the government website. No justification for use. Why I say that? Well, on the internet, you know, there are plenty of practitioners who tout the, uh, sorry, um, the, the benefits of, of thermography, and they're all practitioners that own thermography. So uh, the benefits are financial benefits uh, in their bank accounts, um, as far as I can see. Uh, there, there's, there are no studies that are showing true benefits. The internet. Know what's on the internet because your patients uh, are going <laughs> to tell you about it. Uh, which you probably get all the time. Uh, some patients come with fantastic information that they've kind of picked through what's, what's right and wrong uh, and what's useful off the internet. Some come with just crazy stuff. Uh, I just, this last week, just got on the internet and looked uh, under screening mammograms and uh, breast cancer and some of the things I got. Uh, screening mammography causes most cancers. There's a lot about that. Um, breast compression induces cancer to metastasize. You know, you, you smush the cancer and it, it spills all out, which I thought was very interesting. Um, chemotherapy has no value in breast cancer therapy. So Susan Summers from Three's Company was on Oprah two weeks ago saying this. And no benefit to chemotherapy. I guess on Three's Company she got a lot of experience with chemo. Um, yeah, this is, a, this is a great one. Exercise regularly so that the cancer will give up on you and go after slower, weaker women instead. Um, that's that, I like, I like that a lot. <laughs> so this is one of the things that came up on the internet. Uh, this guy's a neurosurgeon, the Blaylock Wellness Report. Somehow he's got into breast imaging. Uh, he says, mammograms actually increase your risk of developing cancer from 1% to 3% per year. If you religiously undergo a mammogram every year for 10 years, you increase your risk 10 to 30%. So he's, he's taking Hiroshima radiation data just straight out of the book and applying it to mammography. So ionizing radiation, yes, there's, a, there's definitely a risk of ionizing radiation in any exam you have, including mammography. Uh, but he, he's, he's ignoring everything else. Reality, so this is from the uh, uh, Breast Symposium in California a couple weeks ago. This is uh, Harvard, a pre-release on a study of 7,000 women uh, that uh, uh, they were split out, those that uh, had screening uh, mammography done and those who didn't. 75% of breast cancer deaths occurred in the 20% of women who were not screened. And this, is, this is amazing data that they've come up with. Mortality rate for regularly screened women who had breast cancer, 5% mortality rate. For those that who did not get screening, the mortality rate, 56%. Uh, I don't know what better information you need than that. Reality, 98% five-year survival rate in the United States for localized cancer. So that's stage one cancer or DCIS, so cancer is less than two centimeters in size. 31.7% survival rate for advanced disease. So why do we say that? Well, you got to catch it early. You don't catch it early, look what happens. Current uh, American Cancer Society got, uh, site states 85%, although the symposium said that our, our rate today is 92% overall, overall survival rate for uh, breast cancer in the United States. You know, we've been, We've got there's a lot of talk about how bad our healthcare system is and it needs to be changed and obviously there are some changes that need to be made but you know how great Europe is but if you look at our results versus uh, European results in breast cancer much better we're doing something right now, part of that's uh, been attested to our aggressive screening techniques a part of it's is therapy it's probably 50 50 we've got very good therapies and we're very aggressive with our therapy So are there risks to mammography and, and exams that have ionizing radiation, such as BSGI? Absolutely, there's a risk. But it's a risk-benefit, uh, you know, where you're going to place it. There's much more benefit. 
ultrasound and MRI don't have ionizing radiation, so there's no issue with the risk there. So the standard breast uh, imaging algorithm, screening mammography first, diagnostic mammography if you need it, diagnostic ultrasound as an adjunct to diagnostic mammography, and then in certain situations and in screening populations, VSGI and MRI are, uh, are utilized and also staging as well. So this is the BIRAD system. So in conclusion, we have a codified workflow. That's BIRADS. Mammography is still the workhorse. And it's the entry point for all, all other screening. And it should not be avoided. You should encourage your patients. Everything flows from there. All right. Any questions? Do we have time for questions? I think so. I'm not sure what time is. 1034. Thanks. Maybe you have a quick question for Dr. Yeah. No, 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 no. Uh, there, uh, breast uh, density is there's a spectrum. So uh, generally, as a woman ages, uh, the breasts become more and more fatty replaced. And so, on a mammogram, uh, fat is 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 dark on a mammogram. And so, it's easy to see cancers which end up being very light in the setting of a background of fat. And so, as you have more, as you get more and more breast parenchyma. Um, the density it, it gets brighter and brighter and brighter, and it mixes with what we what we see with malignancies. Meaning, you know, fatty breast I can see a lot because it's dark. And extremely dense breast is just like you see on those pictures. It's kind of a whiteout. It's trying to find you know a, a flake of snow in a snow field is is very tough. So um, you know, it's mammograms much easier to read when they're they're fatty replaced. Oh, no, metal implants. So, so uh, breast implants, MRI is great for. Um, but if you have, uh, you know, clips in the brain or you have a pacemaker or a spinal stimulator, um, uh, those are some piece, metal pieces that we, we can't, uh, can't put you in MRI because we're going to shut your stimulator down. We're going to shut your pacemaker down. We don't want to have to code you in the magnet. So. Fine, they're they're fine. Yeah. What if a woman um, or even a teenager? What if they do have a lump? They do a diagnostic ultrasound, and they say, okay, it's normal tissue. They continue, and so that lump's there forever. Um, you know, do they do? Is that something that would qualify them on a chart where they continue to follow up then? Uh, well, that, that's that's a little more complex question. You might think. Um, Generally, when, when a young female comes in under the age of 30, in, instead of starting with mammography because their breasts are still developing, we gen generally start with, in a palpable abnormality, with ultrasound. Uh, we don't want to expose them to ionizing radiation before it's absolutely uh, necessary. So uh, if there's a palpable abnormality that they feel, generally you're going to come to a radiologist, we'll do an ultrasound of the abnormality. If there's a solid lesion there, generally we're going to see it if it's palpable. If it uh, just looks like regular breast tissue, um, then what we recommend, we generally we say, this is normal breast tissue, but we always put a caveat on there. You need to follow this clinically, meaning make sure this doesn't change over the course of time. Because regular breast tissue, this abnormality should, on exam, feel the same three months from now you know, as it does, does now. Um, so going to MRI and that, that, that uh, patient population, don't really need to go there. Um, generally, it's it's ultrasound exam. If there are some complex issues, you know, there are other you could you could take additional steps imaging wise, but uh, but generally that's that's where it ends with the ultrasound. Uh, no, it, it, the. It, 
when you when you do an uh, ultrasound in in isolation without the mammogram, uh, most often a BIRADS category is not applied to that. Um, it's only when you, you start with the screening that that you go through the workflow and, and BIRADS is mandatory. We we currently apply BIRADS to all MRIs as well, but but in the just patient comes with for an ultrasound for palpable abnormality, no, it's it's generally not applied. Uh, just a capsular contracture. Uh, still, mammography is the first choice. The, the issue with mammography is those calcifications, and that so many cancers develop early with calcifications, so we could see them at a, at a, you know, uh, well before their ever invasive disease. Uh, MRI is great for, for seeing abnormal uh, enhancement, but sp still the specificity of MRI is, is somewhat suspect in that, you know, in the best of hands, you're going to get a specificity that's going to range in the 50% range. Um, so you want to start with the mammograms to look for those calcifications, and then if you see abnormal calcifications, there's no need for an MRI. They just need to be biopsied. Um, so capsular contracture and, and the presence of, of implants, still mammography is the first studied order.